Our third session on humans and animals in theology and evolution will begin with a presentation by Professor Celia Dean Drummond from the Department of Theology at University of Notre Dame. Her paper is entitled, The Wisdom of the Liminal, Reimagining the Image of God in an Evolutionary Multispecies Context. Please welcome Professor Dean Drummond. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. So, where am I going to begin? I'm going to, if you like, rethink the human question. And rethink, the, by rethinking the human question as the image of God, I'm also rethinking the God question. But I'm going to do it in a slightly different way from normal because I'm going to be thinking about um, what's uh, the background of this particular approach um, in the Anthropocene. Um, and also weave in then examples of how we as humans are entangled with other species and how that's part of our evolutionary history. I'm also going to talk about theodrama. We had from Professor Hort the idea of the drama of life, but I'd like to start thinking about theodrama as primary and then think about how that then fits into new evolutionary paradigms that are starting to surface, ones that maybe we haven't thought about before or not enough. Those which include the agency of other creatures. And then I'll have one or two comments on human agency as well. But let's start from the beginning. What about the classical accounts of, of Adam and Eve? And just running through this, the Anthropocene and the challenges for science and theology. So to go through those in order, the classical accounts. Genesis 1.27 speaks of the creation of, of humanity, male and female. Um, this is what the image of God is about. It also talks about um, having dominion over the earth um, and, what, and how to understand that in terms of our relationship with other animals. And so this is how we've thought of, primarily thought of what image bearing might mean in terms of perhaps our, cap uh, our capacities, perhaps reason, freedom or creativity um, as those particular capacities that have been used in the classic tradition. Or maybe um, more recently people have turned to function the particular tasks that humanity has to do in the world, um, drawing on the idea of have dominion. Many haven't been satisfied with either of those. They've talked more about relationships, um, image, uh, mirroring uh, the, the image of, of God into a, a relationships rather like or analogy with the Trinity, so a relational approach. And yet other theologians have focused in on, on being as such, or to use a fancy philosophical word, word ontology. I would say that all of these, to some extent, put human beings on a pedestal in relation to other animals. And uh, the idea of the image of God tends to endorse that particular role, um, because God being uh, thought of as supreme being over other creatures then reinforces the idea of humans in the image of God somehow being superior or supreme. I would say that, however, that what are we supposed to do with this kind of um, information? Whoops, I seem to have lost track of where I am on here. Um, what are we to do with this sort of information? The Anthropocene is, as it were, the new geological era in which we find ourselves now, according to many scientists we have become woven into the structure, the geological structure of the earth, or we will be woven into it because of the sheer impact that we have on the planet. This story of, about human beings in relation to the earth is then one of dominance. And so you could say, well, it's not just theologians that have put humans in the superior position. Somehow, even in geology now, we've talked talking about a story of, of extreme dominance in the Anthropocene. 
In the geological record, then, the Anthropocene replaces the Holocene, which is what we were in before. Some people say it started about uh, 10,000 years ago with the, industri with the uh, start of agriculture. Others say that the Anthropocene starts um, around the Industrial Revolution. Um, but I think that, in the, that this sort of uh, narrative, grand narrative, if you want to call it that, about who we are as human beings, leads to a, a tendency to a kind of fatalism. If you like, we have uh, charted our, our history on the earth and now we are in this position of extreme dominance. Is there, are there new ways of telling the story? Um, we hadn't heard a lot about stories from Professor Hort, but maybe there's, maybe there's a, a new way to tell the story. Um, maybe theology just has become part of the problem in its, its narratives about human domination. Perhaps it can also become uh, part of the solution. So, um, how are we then to, to rethink um, what theological wisdom might have to say? There are challenges, of course, in even suggesting this particular approach. First of all, um, the dominance of anthropocentrism, even within the <coughs> theological narratives, generally speaking. Um, and, uh, and certainly the, um, the tendency amongst theologians to see human beings in an exclusive way as excluding other creaturely kinds uh, and putting in the centrality of the human in, in what's known as anthropocentrism. Um, and secondly, the other problem with taking this particular approach is that um, the, the particular uh, narrative of, e of the evolutionary account tends to try and explain religion through evolutionary accounts itself. So uh, what, uh, what we heard of earlier today, um, an example of, of evolutionary naturalism. Um, religion becomes just one more characteristic of humans that we have to explain by evolutionary means. In addition to that, if we think of human beings as evolving over many, many millennia, and only coming at the very, very last second, as it were, in the, in the 24 hour clock that the whole of the history of the cosmos represents, then this tends to relativize any theological contribution or any contribution of the human at all. So there's a sense in which it, it undercuts um, any significance of what theology might have to say to the discussion. Theologians can respond to these uh, challenges by saying, well, we're not really talking about anthropocentrism in theology, we're talking about theocentrism, the God part of the God question, as it were. So humans, the God at issue is always there, and so therefore we're not anthropocentric, we are theocentric. But, in this, uh, but I think that um, humans are, still tend to be cast as separate from other creatures in, the, in these accounts. Um, and and this, is, uh, th this is even even though that some other theologians who started to get interested in this question believe that actually the main division is between creatureliness and God, uh, which puts humans in alliance with other animals rather than the division between humans and other animals. The idea, uh, and I would agree with some of my colleagues who've spoken this morning, um, that science is at war with theology, I would say, is, is, is wrong in, in, for the most part, at least amongst practicing scientists. I would say that the more common attitude is to ignore theology altogether and think, well, it doesn't really have anything particular to say to how we do science or what science must, might have to contribute. So, uh, so my analogy in this instance is to think of it as so science and, and theology is rather like a, an old married couple that have now um, forgotten how to speak to one another. <laughs> they ignore each other because for, for the best part of most of what they do, they can get along quite nicely, thank you, without, without the other. <laughs> so how do we begin to get the conversation going again? How do we do some sort of, uh, I wouldn't say family therapy because um, they've been apart for so many thousands of, so many years, hundreds of years. First of all, the self-reflective cognitive powers do distinguish humans from other species. 
But I would say that the early hominins had entangled lines with um, other creatures. And so, therefore, if we start to think about some of the uh, work of anthropologists, uh, we find some very unlikely associations. And so for, for this part of the, the talk today, I'm going to start looking at some, of some work by anthropologists' uh, field research um, in, in working with uh, human-animal associations. And I think, um, I, I don't know exactly what, uh, what we're going to hear from Dr. Putz after me, but um, if we do overlap, then I'm sure it doesn't hurt to, to hear some of these stories again. Hyenas, um, or Krokutu, Krokutu, Krokuta, is the spotted hyena. Um, and one of the stories that I've encountered recently about the relationship between hyenas and humans isn't the kind of story that you might associate with hyenas. It actually is extremely surprising. Well, it was surprising to me anyway. That um, in Harar, which, Harar, which is a, a small town in Ethiopia, the association, it's a Muslim town, and the association between hyenas and humans has been going on for some considerable time. And what they have found is that the hyenas have become semi-domesticated in that they are highly dependent on anthropogenic foods, that is, food that comes from humans. Um, and so the lives of humans and hyenas are entangled in this particular community, including the way they do their religious practices. Now, I'm not suggesting for the moment that the kind of theology here is the kind of theology we need. What is interesting, though, is the close interweaving and the entanglement of the two of the lives of, this, uh, the, of the human community with the hyena community. And the person who's done this particular work is a, um, someone who's only just gained their doctorate in anthropology. It's an absolutely fascinating doctoral thesis um, and uh, one that I was alerted to by my colleague, Augustin Fuentes, who's the head of the, uh, the anthropology department in the university where I work. And in this uh, thesis, he speaks about the association between hom hominins and hyenas right back to 4.4 million years ago. I know it's hard for us to get our head around this kind of thing, but the Ardithopocenes um, and, the, and the hyenas associated with one another. And of course, the hyenas consumed the bones of these um, early ancestors of ours, so many of the remains we haven't been able to find because they were uh, chomped up by the hyenas. Um, half a million years later, the Australopithecus um, anamnesis, you still find this association going on. That's 3.9 million years ago. Um, and uh, and 3.6 million years ago, you've come to the Australo Australopithecus um, afarensis, and this is where we find some inter further interesting uh, results, because um, we find here um, evidence of this association in in some work that uh, that's been done by um, archaeologists and, and paleontologists. In, uh, in, this, uh, in Tanzania. Um, and, uh, and, and Marcus uh, Baines Rock describes this association um, it, uh, in this particular quotation. I'm going to read out from, from his uh, dissertation. And it's almost, I, th I would say, lyric in its description of this association. So this is what he says. So think about the time of this as well, back into deep time millions of years ago. So later still, 3.6 million years ago, at a place now known as Laetoli in Tanzania, a volcano now extinct was belching ash into the air above an ancient landscape that was not dissimilar from that of the present. The ash fell with rain and filled wide depressions in the ground surface, creating beds of light gray mud across one of which three hominins ventured onto the plains from the woods of the south. There were three individuals, a male, a female, and a juvenile, the earliest known <coughs> nuclear family. And their footprints became incontrovertible evidence of the bipedality 
of their species. The sodden ash crystallized and cemented quickly in the heat of the sun. Then soon afterwards, another layer of sodden ash filled the depressions, miraculously preserving the moment in time for paleontologists to discover millions of years later. And among the other animals whose footprints were preserved at Laotoli were the ubiquitous hyenas. So what he says is that hyenas and early hominins and uh, hominids co-evolved. And so um, it also puts a new spin on why the bones of humans uh, or hominins at that time were particularly badly damaged. Many of the early writers and anthropologists assumed that this damage, these damage in the bones was a result of the fact that these early hominins were violent to one another, the killer ape hypothesis. But this has now been challenged because the bone marks are actually the bone marks of hyenas. Um, so we were prey to uh, these huge predators. And I have to say that other carnivorous animals that co-evolved with humans around at this time included leopards as well as a, a very giant saber-toothed cat called Megaterion wittii, as well as Pacey crocuta, Brevosaurus, Brevos, I can't say the word. Anyway, I will show you um, this. <laughs> so, um, Homo agaster and this creature, which is a giant hyena, co-evolved. Imagine being wandering around and having this creature try to eat you the whole time. It's not something you'd particularly want. So I'm not trying to paint a romantic view of the association between humans and animals, far from it. What I'm saying is that we evolved in terror of these other predators. And so our own psyche, as it were, was um, built around this particular um, issue. And here you have a map of early hominin, uh, uh, hominin hominid evolution. <coughs> And you will see I've ringed, um, so Homo agaster is the time when you've seen this uh, giant hyena presence. Um, I, I've ringed the, the top part of, of early hominin history. Um, and there's a, uh, there's a reason for that, because one of the reasons that anthropologists are still uh, trying to work out is why only one subspecies out of the collection of all these different species of, of hominids, only one of them, um, Homo sapiens sapiens, survived. But let's get back to the story of what happened to our co-evolved partner, the giant hyena. Eventually it was replaced by the smaller spotted hyena, and the only African species persisting in Europe after glacial cycles with humans, that, the hominids that is, were the hyenas. Eventually hyenas disappeared from Europe and Asia, but that only took place a mere 10,000 years ago. For virtually all of our human history, from 4.4 million years ago right through to 10,000 years ago, we were living in association with hyenas. It's a staggering statistic. I think what is crucial then is that our human becoming was not in an isolated context. It was within association with other species. And we still do not why, know why the Homo sapiens sapiens was more successful. Something different and something distinct was stirring in this particular species. And it seemed to be the particular way of being a social animal that, was, that comes to the forefront in many anthropologists' minds now. But in any case, lives with other animals were deeply entangled. And if we look at the cave art that came uh, uh, some time later, well, many of the images are of animals. And people haven't really stopped to think, well, why is this the case? Um, it is the case, I think, because our association with them was so important. What I'd like to do now is to look, jump from uh, deep in paleological time to um, current, something more current, um, and go to uh, the Indonesian island of, of Bali, where uh, my colleague Augustin Fuentes has done some research on macaques. And he's researched the, the long-tailed macaque here, 
in the forest complex, temple forest complex, um, and, uh, and he uh, has found what he calls nature cultural zones, contact zones, where subtle behavioral and ecological interactions are uh, formed against the backdrop of what he calls the long durée of human histories and paleo histories. So what he's saying is that they are, um, whoops, I want to go back. They are not in uh, strictly a competition with, with human beings or strictly um, in reciprocal relationships, but something um, slightly different. Uh, and I'm just going to give you a quotation from an article he wrote. Um, and th this is a little bit technical, but those of you who are biologists will understand what this is. If you're not sure what, what this means, then we can talk about it in the discussion. So this is what he says. The interface between species constructs mutual ecologies that structures their, it is the interface between species constructs and mutual ecologies that structures their relationships. In these zones, there is an entanglement of economies, bodies, and daily practice that leads to the construction and co-production of niches. Niches meaning um, the way we shape or re reshape the world uh, ar around us. And that it becomes very crucial when we think about different evolutionary models that I'll come to in a minute. In the temple complexes, the macaques become participants in ritual practices. So rather like the participants in the ritual practices of the hyenas in, um, in Harar, again, you find uh, these uh, primates becoming, uh, becoming participants. And so he, he arrives at what you might call an ethno-primatology. Um, now, Marcus Baines Rock didn't talk about an ethno-hyenotology, but you, he could have done. The idea being that you start to read the lives of these other animals using tools that have traditionally been kept just for the human species. And so you see the two, as it were, as evolving in association with one another rather than in a separated kind of way. And so the human alteration of the landscape in Bali um, has had an impact on the population genetics of the macaques. And so the, the, the gene flow in this population goes down particular riverine corridors that have been manipulated and created by the human population, leading to what you might call as very fluid and reciprocating interfaces, um, creating... Um, it's a, a, a different kind of approach to the ecological niche. So the two species intersecting and in, intercalating with one another. I'm just going to give you some examples. These photographs are the courtesy of Augustin Fuentes again from his field research in, in, in Bali in Indonesia. And you'll see the associations here with, uh, between macaques and, and humans. Here are the temple complexes. I'm now going to change tack um, to something a bit different. How can we envisage the human role in the light of these kinds of interactions between species? I suggest we can envisage it in, in, in the language of performance rather than the language that we have uh, in the classic tradition of particular attributes, although this will be significant, or particular functions. If we think of performance or performativity as being one of the main ways of, that we can rethink re imaging, imaging God, then um, the role of humans in theological language becomes one of theodrama. You heard about the drama of life today, but I'd like to think about theodrama. And so it in, we can also take in then, if we have a theodramatic approach, the idea of the tragic, which I won't go into this because we've had a, a lot of discussion on suffering this morning, but it's a one way of trying to think about how do we, how do we begin to make sense of, of suffering. So performance then shapes both who we are and what we become or what we will become. And I'm using the language of theodrama from a theologian called Hans Urs von Balthasar who wrote a 10-volume theological aesthetics called The Glory of the Lord, and then a five-volume uh, account of, of theodrama. 
But in none of this did he think about the particular relationships between humans and other animals as being insignificant. So I'm changing his position somewhat, but I'm using some of the language that he uses to, to start uh, talking about this. The stress then on, in, in drama is on human agency, context, and plot. The subjects, um, the stage, and action uh, 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 is also uh, an aspect. Um, as well as the freedom to do good or ill. So in other words, what it's bringing in is this idea of contingency that we've heard it a couple of times already. But in addition to that, um, theological anthropology can become inclusive and performative. So it become, become inclusive by thinking about other um, animals as agents. And so in this way, we start to weave in um, the agency of other animals into our own. It doesn't have to be self-conscious agency in the way that we think of agency, but it, it's certainly an agency nonetheless. So there's an analogous relationship, I would say, between theodrama and, uh, and niche construction, which I'm going to be speaking about next. Um, and just as the, uh, the language that we use by, about God is anag analogous to language that we use about the human. So the language that we use in, in, uh, in the scientific sphere can become in some sense analogous with our theodramatic language. I'm not, I'm not saying that they are writing the same script. I'm saying there are certain analogies which are helpful. There are, of course, metaphysical differences. But I think by beginning with this idea of analogy, it starts to build a bridge with scientists who are working in this particular field. In terms of a particular method, I would say that this is, draws on the idea of a reason search through faith. So can evolutionary biologists ever kind of admit this kind of approach? And in order to work that out, I think we have to go back again to the science and look at some of the evolutionary narratives that are around now. I would say that the main tension between theology and evolutionary science um, stems from what you might call evolutionary determinism, which has tended to dominate the discussion. But there are alternatives now that are beginning to come to the surface amongst evolutionary biologists. A significant book by Eva Jablonka and Marianne Lamb is called Evolution in Four Dimensions. And so the first dimension is the dimension that we heard about already today, the dimension of genetics and natural selection, which is the more dominant um, dimension. There's also um, another dimension, the dimension of epigenetics. Um, that is that some heritable variation is non-random in character. Um, and, uh, and it also... Um, there are a third dimension of something that's, in, that's heritable, heritable change. If you define evolution as heritable change, it's, it's uh, in terms of, of behaviors, behaviors that are learned and then passed down. He, um, this third dimension is distinctive of human species, um, especially in terms of uh, the developed symbol formation. And so humans have sometimes been called, as the, called the symbolic species. If you're a biologist, I'm sure you'll come back to me and say, oh, well, theodrama is just another example of symbol formation or symbol making. But I think we can go a little bit further than that and start thinking more about niche construction as a new evolutionary paradigm. And I think it's important because it represents a particular philosophical shift in the way evolution is understood. It bridges the biological and the, and the cultural sciences in a way which I think is important. In the classic understanding, environmental factors are external and natural selection is the ultimate explanation. And this is um, really what, uh, certain, certainly what's been presupposed in almost all the conversations I've seen between theology and, the, and, and natural uh, and, and evolutionary accounts. Um, external factors then act as a weak negative force um, 
Some, spe some uh, vari variants do not survive. Um, and so certain internal genetic traits are then preserved to the next generation. This is the classic neo-Darwinian account of evolution by natural selection. What ends up then is that the most, uh, those that characteristics that are selected are the most adapted to the environment. In this scheme, natural selection is an ultimate category. Behaviors, which are sometimes called phenotype by biologists, are in a sense secondary. But if we look at uh, this, what you might call a newer approach of niche construction theory, that's not just uh, one part of the equation isn't privileged, as it were, but there's reciprocal causation between, um, between the, the, uh, the, the, the genes and also what's happening in the, in the, in the environment. The environment isn't simply a, a passive um, a space on which uh, genes are selected, but it becomes, in, but it becomes interactive. So the idea of causation by an ultimate gene becomes itself problematized. Um, natural selection is then in dynamic inter interchange with the niche, and the niches are itself selected and crafted and constructed. It's multiple interacting creatures go, on, go towards making this particular niche, so it becomes quite complicated. You have to see not just a single uh, species interacting, but multiple species interacting with one another. <clears throat> Furthermore, the physical niche is not then separated from the cultural or the societal niche. The niche then becomes integral to the inheritance process itself, rather than something just sort of there. And it's a little bit like, um, if you think of a theological analogy, it's rather like uh, thinking of creation as the backdrop of salvation history. That is now no longer acceptable in the sense of it doesn't give sufficient priority to creation. Well, if you see this as, in a sense, now giving much greater credence to a, niche, a, a constructive process where there's an interaction going on. So in other words, theologians are just as um, liable to as evolutionary biologists are focusing on one particular aspect and forget the, forget the whole. So other species in this scheme are not outside influences but integral to hominid evolution and vice versa. So we've seen some, some modern examples of this in the, in the, um, in the way that, that uh, other, other um, primates in associate and interact with humans, but this has been going on for a very long time. And uh, of course, I'm not just simply drawing on, on the work of one or two anthropologists. There's also um, eminent biologist Patrick Bateson from U Cambridge, University of Cambridge, who speaks extensively in his book on, on evolution, on the active agencies of other animals. Um, and, uh, and he says that uh, Here's a, um, a quotation from, from his particular book. He says this. Organisms were doubtless usually passive in the initial stages of biological evolution, driven by environmental change, but they could also have been active. This is the key conceptual point in understanding how plasticity and behavior can drive evolutionary change. By their mobility, in the case of animals, or facility to disperse in the case of plants, organisms often expose themselves to new conditions that may reveal heritable variability and open up possibilities for evolutionary change that would not otherwise have taken place. Now I find this extremely exciting as a theologian interested in theodrama. The reason is that other animals and human beings in themselves become, in some sense, agents of their own evolution. So here we have a certain coherence between the theodramatic account and the account of evolutionary biology, or rather, I would say, the new evolutionary biology. The environment is not simply a flat plane against which uh, our genetic genes push, push ahead, as it were, 
but an interacting and interfacing surface. Humans are agents, but so are also other creatures. But of course, humans are agents in a different kind of way. I'm now going to go back again to the idea of theodrama. And we've heard something about the importance of drama from Professor Hort. But what I want to, to stress again is the, is the idea that our human histories and the history of nature is close, are closely into, intertwined. And again, uh, Professor Hort is, is um, one of the writers that's really stressed this particular aspect. Theodrama um, focuses in on particular scenes in the story, so resists becoming an epic. Now, this is where maybe I differ slightly from um, Professor Hort, in that I think that um, the, dr the dramatic accounts focus in on what you might call sub-acts in the plot. And if we concentrate on the overall epic, we can sometimes get lost um, or have a sense of what, we, what we've heard of as homelessness because we're overwhelmed by the extent to which we are so insignificant. It's a grand narrative then where uh, we, we imagine ourselves as being observers. Um, and I would say that this is not necessarily desirable. We do need to try and put ourselves in, in the position of participants. I'm being told that I'm running out of time, so I better speed up. Um, so I can, <laughs> uh, no need to, to raise some... Uh, cards with five minutes left or something on it. Uh, theodrama, evolution, prehistory, and human history. This is what uh, theodrama, the theodrama includes. So it in, in weaves together histories and future hope. Um, it's also concerned with God's purposes. Um, just very quickly, I've only got two more slides. So um, dramatic includes indeterminacy. There's still purpose in human life. But perfection, though, is achieved through the virtues. So again, a difference from, um, from, from the scientific account. Um, and the ultimate goal is shalom. So these last three points are, mark out a difference from evolutionary narratives. So I'm not saying that they're exactly the same, because there's some tension still remains. And the metaphysics, then, is somewhat different. So final conclusions. The drama, drama and analogy of niche construction. Um, theological anthropology is about human performance in relation to other creatures. Theodrama provides a metaphor for creaturely action in relation to God. And then lastly, one, something I haven't had time to develop, but I can in the questions if you're interested, practical wisdom is a crucial virtue. Thank you very much. Thank you.